Eshade by Eshade Studios is a non-violent open-world RPG. You are a painter traveling to a small island that was very special to your late mother in order to both stoke your creative fires with new surroundings and paint some things of importance to her to preserve her memory. It's also one of my very favorite games I've ever played. But I feel like even just saying that does it a disservice. Eshade is more than just a great piece of design and presentation. To me, it represents a fulfilled promise. For as long as I've been interested in video games, there's always been this idealized experience in my mind that I've always known was possible, but for some reason always eluded me. The experience of letting myself soak into a game's world so much that I feel like it's a real place, that I could spend hours there and forget I'm just playing a game. I've heard people talk about that feeling, and I felt it in passing before, for sure, but Eshade is the first time I consistently felt it, instead of having it just be fleeting. There's several reasons why I felt so strongly about my 9 or so hours in Eastshade the way I didn't feel about my 30 plus hours with Skyrim. I think one of, if not the main reason, is how intimate the whole world feels. Skyrim is so huge that it has to be held together by duct tape and tons of things have to be recycled. No matter how far you travel, no matter how many theoretically different landscapes you get to see, you're probably still going to be doing radiant quests and fighting Drogar. Eshid may not have the scale of Skyrim, but that's definitely to its benefit. It's a minuscule world by the standards of most open world RPGs, and it opens slowly by those standards as well. In most of these games, including ones I love, like Fallout New Vegas, part of the appeal is that there's not much standing between you and the rest of the world almost right away. There's tons of places you can go in Skyrim or New Vegas right after the starting area. Eastshade doesn't do that. You arrive in Lindau and the surrounding wild area, and you scrounge up enough glowstones to pay the bridge toll. Then you get access to a much bigger forest area, but you still must find three people to vouch for you before you can enter Nava. In Nava, you can eventually get the sealant that you need to make a raft and head over to the other, less populated half of the world, which may have a lot of physical space, but is far less dense with quests and content. And after that, plus a little balloon ride to the top of the mountain, you're pretty much done. Like I said, it was about 9 hours for me, so what left me with such a strong impression? Firstly, the compactness of the world makes it far easier to remember. You can get a map, but there are no map markers or a compass or anything, and you really don't need them. The world is inherently navigable, filled with trails and landmarks, interesting things to look at that'll stick in your mind and help you get your bearings. If you don't have anything to remember around you right now, it's not difficult to find a trail that will take you to something eventually, and because the world is so small, getting lost is never a big concern. There is a day-night cycle, and unless you have tea or a coat or a tent, you can be caught outside without warmth, but really, the consequences are minimal. You have no lives or health, and just end up where you last slept. This plays into another thing that makes East Shade's world so enveloping. How unpunishing and unaggressive it is. One of the first things you're likely to hear about East Shade is that it has absolutely no combat. That's how I was introduced to the game anyway, in an excellent video by Ragnarox. But what's more important than the lack of combat is what East Shade fills itself with instead. Gentleness and warmth. Not everyone you come across is friendly or even a good person, but no one is out to hurt you. You never need to be on guard, there's rarely any kind of pressure, and that made it so easy for me to immerse myself. One thing I can say about the folks here, they never ask for swords. Which pleases me greatly, because swords are just about the most boring things you could ask a blacksmith to make. Weird personal thing? I've always been more of a fan of the quiet moments I could see myself living in from stories, rather than the high-stakes, conflict-driven parts. Like, if I wrote Lord of the Rings, it would probably just be three books about life in the Shire. If I wrote Robinson Crusoe or Lost, they would probably just be about people living life in the exotic circumstance of being stranded on an island. Like, I don't know, this game just appeals to that part of my brain. It feels like a world I would love to live in. Like, do people want to live in Skyrim? Do they want to deal with the dragons and the cold weather and the war? Skyrim as a place seems to be only palatable when you're the dragonborn, when you're the most important person and you get to go on big, sweeping, dangerous adventures, but what about the normal day-to-day -day life of everyone else?
East Shade feels empathic and warm towards its inhabitants, most of whom are just going about their lives with good intentions. They have pastimes, they have hobbies and diets, they have places they like to visit, books they like to read, people whose company they enjoy, stories they tell, songs they sing, teas they drink. Life in East Shade seems vibrant and wonderful and relatable, and that does wonders to sell the world for me beyond the beautiful landscapes. The landscapes do have their importance, though. I'm trying to refrain from restating the same points as Ragnarok's, but I think he's absolutely right about how the patient, peaceful tone has the chance to make even someone like me, a generally very bad visual thinker, start seeing patterns and symmetry and potential snapshots everywhere, which is, of course, what the painting mechanic is all about. It's not just that the game itself is gorgeous, which it is, but it also puts you in the best frame of mind possible to appreciate that gorgeousness. One more touch I love is how East Shade frames progress. In most games, progress is represented in some sort of conquest, or some variation of forcefully overcoming a challenge, but East Shade not only has the RPG quests where you help people, which already ties well into the game's friendly and empathic mood, but your most important resource as a painter is inspiration. You get inspiration by, well, doing things to enrich your life and expand the scope of your experiences, discover new places, read books, listen to songs and stories, help people, drink new teas. The game rewards curiosity about and receptiveness to the world, which I love. Does that cover everything I can broadly say about East Shade? I think that covers everything I can broadly say about East Shade. So now we're gonna get into a few specifics, and these are spoilers, I guess. Like, the game doesn't have much of a story, but it's all about discovery, and if anything I said intrigues you, you really just need to go play the game yourself. You can skip to uh, this time to avoid any spoilers. Okay, so you, person who's actually played the game. Or person who doesn't care about spoilers, whatever, but hopefully you person who's actually played the game. Do you remember when you first saw The Great Shade? I do. This beautiful tree with water gushing out of it, a little treehouse nestled in it. Something about that really spoke to my imagination first playing. I really fixated on trees and water when I was a kid, despite not being very outdoorsy due to allergies. Something about them aesthetically has always touched me. Do you remember the first time you felt like you figured something out from your own curiosity? I remember coming across old Glendow just wandering around and finding the book that tells you what water foxes like to eat. A while later, when I had to trap the water fox, I felt so good for retaining the information that the game gave me in a completely unrelated area that I might have missed had I not been so invested in discovering what this game has to offer. And how about that balloon ride? Absolutely gorgeous, getting a big old view of all these places, places you can become familiar with, it means so much more than a bird's eye view of a landscape you've never been in. I remember being weirdly mesmerized by the red plants on Quick Hoof Coast, weird fixation, that one, uh, and the root side out, and, and the dreams, just so good, and the whole mystery at the inn, uh, such a good and creative quest with not many resources, uh, and the first folks living place, uh, something about that scene really touched me, and I just hope for the best for them, and I, wow, I, yeah, I, I came to care a lot about the people in this game. Okay, I've spoiled enough, but believe it or not, there's more memorable moments that I had with this game. I strongly encourage you to maybe tell me about them in the comments if you have played it. This game invites a really personal, patient, introspective mood, one that I think isn't common enough in games, and that makes it really easy to not only be receptive to the game, but reach out and project your own mind onto it. And yes, all art is a kind of dialogue, a, a give and take between the audience and the art, but sometimes the art dominates the conversation and leaves little room for you to interject. Ishade isn't like that. Ishade will listen. It gives you room to pick the best angle for your painting. It lets you breathe with memorable visuals that may hit personal notes for you. It gives you a lovable world that you just want to think about even when you're not playing. It's not often that a game makes an impact on me that extends beyond the boundaries of playing the game, but East Shade offers such a soul-soothing, life-affirming perspective that it's hard not to carry it with me.
Also, there are lesbian bears. L lesbian bears. How can you not love this game? If you don't love this game, you're a homo.